nervous. <laughs> oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angel voice Cry. 
Amen. Appreciate that. Thank you, Miss Liz. Praise the Lord. We uh, learned about that song on Wednesday night in our Bible study and uh, learned how that it was written by a man, a Frenchman, and it was uh, comp the composition, the music was composed by a Jewish man, a man who didn't even know the Lord as Savior. And then it was translated by a, a gentleman who was an abolitionist who was against slavery, but then it was made famous really by a gentleman who was actually one of Thomas Edison's uh, former co-workers who was experimenting with a violin and a, a telegraph and, and played that song, and it was the first radio transmission ever was him reading the Nativity story from Luke chapter number 2 and then playing that song, O Holy Night, on his violin. Back to Luke chapter number 11. Look at verse number 13 again with me, and then I'm going to have you turn to Luke chapter number 1 in a moment. The Bible says here in verse number 13, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? And I want to talk about principles of gift giving this morning, or principles on gift giving. At this time of the year, an enormous amount of attention is given to gifts. Shopping for family, friends, co-workers, neighbors, teachers, general acquaintances consumes our thoughts and much of our time. Unfortunately, unfortunately, numbers of people can relate to the guy who claimed that he kept Christmas in his heart every month of the year because that's how long his Christmas purchases were on his credit card statement. The truth is that a study was done uh, and this study involved over 1,000 adults who were ages 18 and older. It was back between the 4th and the 8th of uh, November of this year. And they asked people, how much do you plan on spending on gifts or on Christmas-related purchases this year? The overwhelming majority said that they were going to be spending $830 this year on gift giving. Out of those... There were 30% who actually said they planned on spending over $1,000 on gifts. 25% of them said that they would be spending somewhere between $500 and $999. We know that Christmas has become commercialized. We understand that. But despite all of the commercialism and despite these maybe, maybe negative, maybe questionable trends in sp uh, spending, the principle of giving and of gifts, and of gift giving, is still found at the heart of the Christmas story. I mean, we're all familiar with the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3.16, that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. This morning, we understand that if God had not given, if He had not sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, we would have no hope of eternity. There would be really no purpose for the life in which we live. To just go to work tomorrow and work Tuesday and work Wednesday and work five days out of the week, six days out of the week for one day of rest and do this for the entirety of our life for what? To ultimately die and have no hope. We would really have a, a worthless life to live. But God has given us hope through His Son Jesus Christ and through the salvation that is offered in faith through in Jesus Christ. And so gift giving can be found. Turn back to Luke chapter number 1. In the Christmas story, we can see not only the principle of gift giving, but the principle of giving in general. If you are born again, you know Christ is your Savior, you have no doubts in your mind about where you're going to spend eternity, then really this message is for you this morning. If you don't know Him, if you're unsure, then I want you to just meditate on that verse, John 3.16. And I want you to ultimately at the end of the message come to the conclusion that God loves you and He wants you to go to heaven. And I want you to make that decision this morning. But this message really is geared more towards those that are already saved. Those that claim to be Christians. Here in Luke chapter number 1, I want to point out three principles on gift giving real quickly if I could this morning. First off, let me talk to you about the pre prerequisite for a gift. The prerequisite for a gift. Look at verse number 28, if you would, and, and so that we don't have to take time to read this entire passage, let me just 
preface our reading of verse number 28 by saying this is the story of the angel Gabriel and his visit to Mary to let her know that she ultimately is going to uh, carry the Christ child in her womb and give birth to the Christ who she is going to name her and Joseph are going to name Jesus. Uh, So that's the story we're looking at this morning. In verse number 28, it says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And then look down to verse number 30 real quickly. Verse number 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. There is always a prerequisite for gift giving or for giving a gift. The prerequisite for a gift is that an individual finds favor in the sight of another individual. You this morning give gifts to people who have found your favor or you receive gifts from people whose favor you have found or who uh, highly esteem you. Here in verse number 28, and then again in verse number 30, the angel lets Mary know, hey, Mary, you have found favor. And you found favor in God's eyes. There is no greater person to find favor, or in whose eyes to find favor than God's. He says, you found favor before God Almighty uh, today. And I am here to deliver a message to you that because you have found favor, in God's eyes, He's going to bestow upon you a gift. Now we know what that gift is, and I've already mentioned it, but uh, we know that that gift is that she was going to not only care, uh, give birth to, but carry the, the Christ or Jesus in her womb. And the 21st, the, the, the 21st century lady may not look at that as a gift from God, but the first century woman did. The first century lady did. Because in the Bible, in the Old Testament and New Testament, in the Bible, it was actually a reproach to be barren, to not be able to have a child. It was a blessed thing to have a child. By the way, this morning, if you are a mother or you're a father, consider that a blessing from God. Because the Bible tells us that God entrusts us with the children that we have. God trusts you this morning to be a good father, To be a good mother. And remember, when we use that word good, it's synonymous with godly. He trusts you to be a godly parent to your child or your children. And so uh, the angel comes and tells her, you found favor with God. And because you found favor with God, God is going to give you a gift. He's going to bestow upon you a gift. That gift is a child. But it's not just any child, Mary. It's the child who is the Christ, the Messiah, or as we refer to him, the Savior of the world. Now, why was it that she found favor? There's two things I see here. First off, in verse number 27, she found, Mary found favor because of her heritage. In verse number 27, it says, To a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Here we're told that Mary came from the lineage of David. Her great, 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 and we could keep going on with the greats, grandfather was David. And then Solomon. She could trace her lineage back to the second king of Israel. And the one who was really known as the man after God's own heart. And then back to his son Solomon, who was considered the wisest and wealthiest of all kings ever to live. This was her lineage. This is what she had to look back to. You know, oftentimes we give gifts as individuals to people because we respect their family. There are times we'll give gifts to a person not because we're very close to them or because we uh, spend a lot of time with them, but ultimately because we know their parents and we respect their parents or we know someone in their family and we respect uh, their family. And here we see that God looked down from heaven. He had a, a, a job. He had to find someone who he was going to entrust with this gift, the most precious of all gifts, and he found Mary. And Mary fulfilled the first prerequisite. She was of the royal lineage. She was a descendant of David's. By the way, being a descendant of David's, it sounds glamorous. It sounds glorious. And it may have been in David's time. And it may have been in Solomon's time. 
When the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah were alive and reigned, but here in the New Testament, 300 years have gone by and the people of God have not heard from God Jehovah. And now here in Luke chapter number 1, this angel comes to her and tells her because she's of the house of, uh, of David, she's going to be blessed because of her testimony. She's going to be blessed with this child. And you know what? She didn't have favor in the sight of all mankind because she was David's uh, great, 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 great granddaughter. She didn't live in a palace the way that David did. She didn't enjoy the luxuries of being a princess or a granddaughter of a king the way that David's immediate offspring and his grandchildren did. No, she now lived the way that a maid in the first century did. And she had the task that a first century maiden had. And so, yes, she was a royal lineage, but she didn't enjoy any extra blessings or extra, I should say, extra uh, benefits as a result of it. Nonetheless, God looked down and He saw her. And He says, you found favor, first off, because of your heritage. Second, she found favor in God's sight because of her holiness. Look again at verse number 27. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. Then in verse 34, remember that the angel tells her, you're going to conceive and you're going to bear a child and you're going to bring forth this child and you're going to call his name Jesus. And, and here's who he's going to be. He's going to be the, the son of the highest. He's going to be the Lord uh, God. He's going to be uh, sitting on the throne of his father David. And she asked the question in verse 34, how shall this be seeing I know not a man? She was a holy maiden. And because of her holiness, God blessed her. Because she had kept herself pure, she was a spouse to, day, uh, to Joseph, which meant, meant that she was uh, engaged to him. She was promised to him. But she kept herself pure, and he kept himself pure. And because they were holy in their living, and they were holy in their uh, actions, their behavior, their demeanor, God looked down from heaven and He said, not only do I see Mary and she's found favor with me, but the young man that is engaged to her, Joseph, he's living holy, he's living right. In Matthew chapter 1, it says that he was a just man. He had a good testimony. And so God ultimately says, I've got this gift to give. I need someone who's going to bear this gift and who's going to give birth to this, this gift. And the prerequisite is they have to be of the holy lineage or the, the royal lineage and they have to be holy themselves. And He gives her the Lord Jesus Christ to bear. She fulfilled the prerequisites. This morning, God wants to give gifts to us as His children. In heaven, He looks down and he says, hey, I've got blessings I want to bestow upon my people. But being a child of the King isn't simply enough. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you, are, uh, you have a heritage. You have a royal lineage. You can look back to. We know of those that are in the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints such as Abraham and Joseph. We know of them and of Moses and, and Daniel. And we can look to them. We can look to these New Testament saints like Paul and Peter and Timothy. And those are our lineage. We can look to recent preachers of the Gospel such as D.L. Moody and, and Billy Sunday and Jack Howes. And this is our lineage as Christians. But we, God doesn't bestow blessings or gifts upon us simply because of our lineage or our heritage. But He bestows them upon us because of our heritage and our holiness. Sometimes people expect God to just give them gifts and, and bless them with gifts because they're His child. Well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Why isn't God being good to me? Why isn't God uh, blessing me? With, why isn't He showing me His, His uh, benefits and bestowing them upon me? Well, just because you're a child of His doesn't mean that you are right with Him. Living holy. Living the way that He would want you to live. That's what ultimately causes you to find favor with God. Mary found favor with God and so she fulfilled that prerequisite. Then secondly, we see the perception of a gift. Not only is there a pre prerequisite for a gift, but there is the perception of a gift by the person who's receiving it. Look, if you would, back to verse number 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Now, Mary here, the Bible tells us, that she was troubled at the saying of the angel. She was troubled by it. 
Why? She obviously knew that this was an angel. Uh, in the New Testament, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Joseph and he appeared to Mary, and later on the angels appear in Luke chapter number 2, uh, the shepherds knew who they were. Later, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, remember the angels that were there at the tomb? People knew that the, those that saw these angels knew that they were angels. Uh, by the way, if you ever wonder why angels hadn't the appearance that they did, and, and, and people talk about the aura or the illumination that the angels had, just think back to the Old Testament. Testament. Moses, his face lit up when? When he spent time with God. These angels, if they had a glow or an aura about them, it's because they just came from the presence of God. And so these, she knew this was an angel, and she heard what he said, but she was troubled at his saying. Why was she troubled at his saying? Because she did not feel worthy of this great gift. She didn't feel worthy to bear in her womb and to give birth to the Christ child, the Savior of the world. She was just a, a simple maiden that lived in a small town by the name of Nazareth. Who was she among so many that God would find favor or she would find favor in God's eyes and God would give her this opportunity? You know, we, when we're presented with gifts, have one of two perceptions. We're either humbled by the gift or we're lifted up in pride and think that we deserve a better gift. It reminds me of the young boy who he saw that a lady had lost her handbag in the bustle of Christmas shopping, and so he found it and he returned it to her. And as she was looking through her purse, she commented, she said, hmm, that's funny. When I lost my bag, there was a $20 bill in it. Now there are $21 bills. The boy quickly replied, that's right, lady. The last time I found a lady's purse, she didn't have any change for a reward. He, oftentimes, we expect a gift the way that that little boy expected a reward. Oh, you've got a gift for me? Well, I expect it. After all, I am your, uh, your worker. You are my employer. I, you owe it to me. That's the wrong type of attitude to have. Oh, my parents are going to give me a gift for Christmas. Why? Because they're my parents and they have to give me gifts. No, nobody has to get me anything. I don't deserve anything. And we don't want to take that, that attitude of, oh, I deserve this, or I deserve better than this. We need to take the attitude that Mary had, uh, an attitude of humility. Mary, as we saw here, she was humbled by this gift. In verse number 29, look there again, it says, and when she saw him, doesn't say when she heard him, when she saw him. It helps us make that connect the dots or make that correlation that she saw him and she knew who he was. He's an angel. And then she thought about what he said. She was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. She was humbled by it. In verse number 30, it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Why would she have been fearful? I mean, when you read the conversation that she has with him, she doesn't sound fearful. Or, or she doesn't fall on her knees out of fear. But I, she was fearful because think of the great responsibility of bringing the Savior of the world into this, this life. And then not only bringing him in, that's just the beginning. That actually, no offense ladies, please don't get upset. That may be the easy part. Then you actually have to raise him. And yes, he's the Son of God and he knows all things and he's always going to be perfect and he's always going to be obedient. But as a parent, you're always wondering, am I doing enough? Am I raising him right? And so she's thinking about this. Wait a second. Not only am I going to bear him in my womb, not only am I going to give birth to him, but Joseph and I are going to have to raise him. Now, I know we probably all understand because our kids have gone through that phase. We've all, we all understand what it's like to raise a kid who thinks that he knows more than we know or she knows more than we know. But guess what? What if you were raising a kid that did know more than you knew? That's what she had facing her. And so obviously inside her, she's fearful. She's humbled. She's saying, I'm not worthy. I don't know if I can do this. And so the angel says, fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God. We ought to be humbled when we receive a gift, especially if it's a gift from our Heavenly Father. What do you mean, uh, Lord, you want me to teach a class? No, I can't teach a class. What do you mean you want me to help in this ministry? I can't help in this ministry. I can't do it. Hey, it's okay. If God has uh, given you a, an ability, a gift, He's going to be with you and He's going to help you use it. Just trust Him. 
Samuel Morris was born into a preacher's family in New England just two years after George Washington was elected the first president of the United States. After he finished his education at Yale, he went to England to uh, hone his painting skills. And upon his return to America, he was recognized as a gifted artist and was soon in much demand. Morris's first wife actually died while he was away from home painting in Washington, D.C. He didn't receive the news until it was too late. As a result, his heart was broken and he turned away from painting and began trying to develop a means of rapid communication over great distances. This eventually led him to his discovery of the telegraph. We know of Morse code. Despite his fame and the many honors that came his way, Morris wasn't proud or boastful. In a letter to his second wife, he wrote, The more I contemplate this great undertaking, the more I feel my own littleness, and the more I perceive the hand of God in it and how He has assigned to various persons their duties, He being the great controller, all others His honored instruments. Hence, our dependence, first of all, on God, then on each other. As God gives to us gifts, we ought to be uh, humbled by them. And in our fear uh, of thinking, how am I going to be able to do this? I can't uh, give God my life. I can't serve God in this area. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to, how to do this. Just remember that we are His instruments. And He's the one that will work through us and use us for His honor and glory. But second, she was honored by it. She wasn't only humbled by this gift. She was honored by it. In verse number 38, it says, And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Ultimately, as she says, the handmaid of the Lord, that word handmaid is, uh, is synonymous with the word servant. Here's the servant of the Lord. Ultimately, her response after having a moment or two to think upon it, to think on the words of the angel of fear not, to meditate on this great opportunity and responsibility, she responds with the words, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. She's like the servant that's been given a task, a task that is beyond their ability, beyond their comprehension of how they're going to get it done, but they then come to the realization, My master has entrusted it to me, and so I am honored by it, and I will try my best to fulfill it, to accomplish it. And that's what she says to him. She was honored by it. When we're given gifts, as I said, oftentimes we're humbled. Oh, why would you think of me at Christmas? Why would you get me something this Christmas? And we're honored by that. As our kids, I said a moment ago, will give us gifts at Christmas time. My favorite gifts that my kids give me are the ones that they make themselves. Oh yeah, the, the drawings might be a little bit uh, incorrect. The, the people, you know, the stick figure might have three hands instead of two. Uh, but when Timothy or Jonathan or Esther or Naomi or even Abigail give me something that they've made themselves, I know it's coming from their heart. And so it, it's honoring to me. When God gives us a gift... We need to understand that it's coming from Him, from His heart, and it ought to honor us. And then finally, the last thing we see here, the purpose of the gift. The purpose of the gift. It tells us here in this passage, verse number 32, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto Him the throne of His father David, and He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of His kingdom there shall be no end. Ultimately, we're told that... He's going to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. But the real purpose behind His birth was His death, obviously. Remember the words of the angel Gabriel to jo uh, Joseph uh, a little bit later, recorded for us in Matthew chapter number 1. In Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 21, it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This was the purpose of the, of the gift that God was giving. First off, to be a blessing to her. Because she was in need of a Savior. The religions, the denominations, the faiths that are out there today that have elevated Mary to a position where she is a Savior of her own or she is prayed to have done a great disservice to the Word of God and have done a great disservice to Mary herself. Because if Mary could stand before you this morning and she could give you a testimony, her testimony would be this, He is my Son, but He is my Savior and my God. Remember, she was the one there at the foot of the cross. And Jesus turned her over to John, the disciple, and 
told John, hey, now it's your job to care for my mother. Showing us that Joseph obviously had passed on and was off the picture when Jesus went to the cross. But ultimately, she knew that she needed the Lord. She knew she needed a Savior. Thus, we saw last week in verse number 19 of chapter 2 in Luke that it says, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She witnessed all that transpired and she realized God gave this gift to me because I found favor in His sight and I'm humbled by it, I'm honored by it, and it's for my benefit so that I can be saved. But not only I can be saved, so that all the world can be saved. How often are we given a gift and it's not only for our benefit, but for the benefit of others around us. I read about a, a gentleman who for Mother's Day, he gave the wor- they said, it's the worst gift ever. He gave his wife an iron. And his wife was so upset by the gift that on Father's Day, she showed him how, how upset she was. She gave him an ironing board. Amen? And so, we've all been the recipient of gifts before that were not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of those around us as well. And that's exactly what Mary experienced as she gave birth to the sa- her Savior and the Savior of the world. Now, as we close, it applies to us in this way because the Bible teaches us that every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father above with whom is no variableness. I'm so glad this morning that God gives us gifts and that He gives us good gifts. Not one thing that God gives us is bad. You notice how so often as people, when something bad in our life happens, we say, why did God allow this? Why did God give this to me? God allows trials to come in our life to make us stronger. Which when we see the trials, they don't look good. But at the end, if we come through them, looking at Him, keeping our faith in Him, they turn out to be good. That's why the Bible tells us in Romans chapter number 8, that all things work together for good to them that love God. American Express did a survey about Christmas gifts. And they found that fruitcake, I know that's sort of an old, old gift. It doesn't seem like people give fruitcakes as much as they did when we were kids. But fruitcake, fruitcake was chosen as the worst holiday gift to give. It got 31% of the vote. You know what? It actually even beat out, number two was no gift at all. So some people said it's better to get no gift at all than to get a fruitcake. That's how bad it was. When asked how to dispose of a fruitcake or how to dispose of a bad gift, they would, 30% of the people surveyed said they would hide it in the closet. 21% said they would return it. And 19% said they would re-gift it. They would give it away. I'm so glad that God doesn't give us bad gifts that we have to hide, that we have to return, or that we have to give away falsely saying hey, this is something you might like, when in reality we know it's nothing that we like. That's why we're giving it away. God gives us good gifts. So what does He want us to do with those gifts? He wants us to take them and use them and share them and minister for Him. Second thing that we can apply is that God wants us to give back to Him in the same manner that He gives to us. How often do we give back to God? What do we give back to God? And we'll close with this. There's a story about four brothers. These four brothers left home for college and became successful doctors and lawyers. Some years later, they chatted as they were having dinner together and they discussed the gifts that they were able to give to their elderly mother who lived far away in another city. Their father had passed on. And so they had each bought their mother a gift. The first one said, I had a big house built for mama. The second said, I had a $100,000 theater built in the house. The third said, I had my Mercedes dealer deliver an SL600 to her. The fourth said, you know how mama loved reading the Bible? And you know how she can't read anymore because she can't see very well? Well, I met this preacher who told me about a parrot that can recite the entire Bible. It took 20 preachers 12 years to teach him. I had to pledge to contribute $100,000 a year for 20 years to the church but it was worth it. Mama just has to name the chapter and verse and the parrot will recite it. The other brothers were impressed by the the fourth brother and his gift. Shortly afterwards, their mother sent out her thank you notes. She wrote to the first, Milton, the house you built is so huge I live in only one room, but I have to clean the whole house. Thanks anyway. Second note said, Marvin, I am too old to travel. I stay home. I have my groceries delivered. So I never use the Mercedes. The thought was good though. Thanks. To the third, she wrote, Michael, 
You gave me an expensive theater with Dolby sound. It could hold 50 people, but all my friends are dead. I've lost my hearing and I'm nearly blind. I'll never use it. Thank you for the gesture just the same. Then finally to that fourth, she wrote, Dearest Melvin, you were the only son to have the good sense to give a, a little thought to your gift. The chicken was delicious. Thank you. <laughs> Somehow it appears that the mother of these four successful men would have preferred a little bit of her son's times, time rather than the gifts that they could give. Trying to figure out how they could outdo each other. Give her a home. Give her a car. Give her a theater. Give her a, a parrot that can recite the Bible. And really all that mother wanted was a little bit of their time. You know, we can talk about all that we do for God, but really God just wants some of our time. This Christmas season, let me challenge you to give back to your Heavenly Father in the same manner that He has given to, to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank You for all that You've done for us. Thank You for all that You've given to us. Lord, I pray that You